Hi there, and Merry Christmas from John and I here at Two Texts. As we take a break over Christmas time, we thought you might like to catch up with a few bonus episodes that we did last year. Perhaps you've only started listening this year, so missed them. So to save you having to scroll back through all those episodes, we're going to repost them this week to give you a chance to listen in and think about Christmas and how different texts of the Bible might enlighten the story for you. We'll be back in the new year on the 10th of January, continuing our Acts series. But until then, have a Merry Christmas from us. So, John, we talked in our last episode from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through to 45, this sort of beginning narrative of the story of Mary. And where we sort of moved on from the from the conversation was round about the point where the Holy Spirit becomes this kind of key feature of, of, of the conversation. So what I'd love to do is pick that back up with you today because there's a couple of pieces. If last episode about Mary was our controversial episode, because I feel like we dealt with all of the hot topics <laughs> in that story, <laughs> what if what if we begin here to talk about this this verse at 35 where the angel says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. What like where do we like let's jump in let's jump into that because this becomes a key point not just for this story this is actually a key theme for Luke and Acts isn't it it totally is in fact he's regarded by many as the evangelist of the holy spirit so he he yes talks about the holy spirit more than certainly the other two synoptics put together, Matthew and Mark. He talks about the Holy Spirit very differently than John talks about the Spirit and records the teaching of Jesus for us in the beautiful sort of last few moments of Jesus' life before he's crucified and some of that beautiful didactic insight into the into Jesus' understanding of the Holy Spirit, which I, I think would influence scholars in, in later years. But but Luke is is showing us from the very beginning the agency of the Spirit, the activity of the Spirit. He is engaging in the story. He's leading the story. He's driving the story. A bit later on, when Jesus gets baptized in water, the Holy Spirit comes on him in bodily form as a dove and then leads him into the wilderness and he goes full of the power of the Spirit. He returns in the authority of the Spirit. He he declares the Spirit of the Lord is on me. You just get the sense of the saturation of the work of the Spirit in the early part of the gospel, which of course for our, our listeners is also mirrored in the early part of the book of Acts, which is Luke's second book. So you get this outpouring of the Spirit, this filling of the Spirit that comes on that first gathered Christian community in Acts mm-hmm. chapter 2 after having been promised by Jesus. So so you get a magnificent um, sort of pneumatology in Luke. Luke is is showing us what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He He's showing us how the Holy Spirit works. He's not giving us a sort of a, a systematic theology of the Spirit, but he is showing the activity of the Spirit, the doingness of the Spirit in our lives. And I don't think it's possible to read the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts and sort of as a follower of Jesus think, I think the Holy Spirit's really important here. And I think the Holy (laughs) Spirit must be really important to me if the Holy Spirit was really important to the story, to Jesus and to the Mm. early church. So so there is a, I think there is a powerful uh, drive here from Dr. Mm -hmm. Luke as he he moves this forward. One of my favourite scholars on Acts talks about how the Holy Spirit works as this kind of power for witness at some Mm -hmm. some sort of level. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. And I think you see that even in Luke. I mean, there's a fun exercise for people to do, uh, and, and preachers, if you do this, you'll you'll give yourself content for 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 months in, in in your in your church. But if you actually take Luke and Acts and sort of lay them almost on top of each other and work them through, you actually see, and I think Luke's doing this intentionally, you see the Holy Spirit doing similar things through the story. You get Holy Spirit-empowered beginnings, you get Holy Spirit-empowered speech, you get Holy Spirit-empowered miracles, and you get Holy Spirit driving and accompanying into the mission of God. And so I think that you're seeing Luke almost set up an agenda here of, I want you to know right from the very start 
that that when the Holy Spirit moves, things change in the in the story of in the story of their lives. And also, you do get and you and you're going to see it in just a minute here. The Holy Spirit seems to lead into some pretty impressive speeches, uh, some mm. pretty impressive prophetic words. So I, I think and the, Gabriel's language to Mary is pretty heavily weighted, isn't it? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the yeah. power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. I mean, this is this is huge, uh, huge language, isn't it? It totally is, and it 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 leads into the. Um, I, I think we're. I think we finished with this last time in the podcast. It, it, it's leading to where Doctor Luke really wants to corner us. He doesn't want us to go anywhere else with this. That in Zechariah and Elizabeth in the in the previous story in the same chapter, you have a natural union, which is just mm. as miraculous because we're told that Elizabeth uh, and Zechariah were both old and that Elizabeth, it, the inference was she was barren even when she was able to have children. Mm. So the fact that they have a child the natural way is is miraculous. It's an incredible miracle. Yes. It takes place. But there is a contrast to the Elizabeth and Zechariah experience to that of Mary. No man is involved. Mm. And in fact, if you if you read the Matthew account, it makes it really, really clear that once Joseph is made aware of what is going on by the various mm. angelic visitations he has, it says that he refused to have any sexual union with Mary until the baby was born. So as if to make it absolutely clear, there is no doubt if you're putting Mm. Luke's story together with Matthew, they're both saying this is supernatural and that you have Mm. a human egg fertilized by the power of the Holy Spirit and you you end up with the Son of the Most High God birthed Mm. in human form, a, a, a unique person Mm. comes to us. So the Son of God always existed. He is the eternal word. He is the Logos. He is the one who was and is and is to come. Mm. But the person of Jesus, this this human person that we meet, is has a beginning. He has a an origin. And this is a miraculous idea that it should make our listeners' head melt. If if the incarnation <laughs> doesn't make your brain fry, then we're not thinking about it right. So if you're if you're feeling like like my supercomputer brain is overheating, don't worry about it. It should because mm. this is a, a concept and an idea that is way above our pay grade, and I don't even begin to understand the full glory of the incarnation. I just accept it by faith that. The Holy mm-hmm. Spirit comes on Mary and you end up with a, hu- a fusion of 100% human into 100% God, which produces the person mm-hmm. we call Jesus. And uh, and that is a unique and gloriously essential idea. This is essential mm-hmm. to our salvation. This is essential to everything that Jesus will achieve on behalf of humanity. And therefore, I, I think that's why the gospel writers are so explicit, David, about the supernatural mm. activity of the Holy Spirit in this event so that no one can question it, at least if, if they want to believe. I always love Zechariah's question in chapter 1 and verse 18, and where he, he basically asks the angel, on the, I think on the behalf of all of us, he asks the angel, like, like really? <laughs> you expect me to believe this? And the angel's answer is yes. And, and I kind of like that, John. I, I, I'm a terrible apologist for these sort of things because I feel like I should offer more reasoned and logical arguments for why these things are the case. But I think the gospel writers, I've said this before, I think they corner us. They say, listen, you're going to read a story. And to read this story, it's going to ask you whether or not you're willing to accept that God steps into history and does things. True. And and if you're not willing to accept that, or you're not even open to the possibility that God may interject his way into history, then these stories are going to be really hard work if you try and read them. And people have tried over the years to do that. And I just find myself thinking, let's just be honest with this here. The story's asking you to believe in the supernatural. If you're not open sure. to think about that, the story is going to cause you problems and uh, take that on the chin. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Now, I would then say to you, read the story anyway and just see yeah. if it 
maybe might not change your opinion on this stuff. But don't, but don't try and rework the story to make it just a regular story with some ancient people trying to be a bit fancy. I just don't think you do anybody any favours by, by doing that. No, totally. And I think we should. We are encouraged in the biblical text from Genesis 1.1. We've, we've already discussed the echo of Genesis 1-1, John 1-1. We are encouraged to embrace the impossible as a fundamental idea. In the beginning, mm. God created the heavens and the earth. However you understand he did it, that's a fundamental statement that you, you must accept if you're going to understand the Hebrew scriptures, if you're going to understand who God is and why he would do such a thing. John 1-1, one, one, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Mm. John is saying, listen, none of this is going to make sense unless you're prepared to accept a fundamentally supernatural idea, that God became human flesh. If you're prepared to do mm. that, then this story rocks. If you're not prepared to do that, this story is going to be like a rock in your brain, and it will absolutely <laughs> it will absolutely uh, torment you. So it, it is, David. I, there's a fund over the years. People have said to me, "Do you expect me to believe that a a virgin conceived by God?" And I went, "Yeah, yeah, I do." <laughs> it's the only way we can read this text in the same way that I'm asking you to believe. And after being in the grave three days. That same person rose from the grave. So, so at the heart of the Christian faith are, and biblical biblical understanding are impossibilities, and of course, mm. doesn't doesn't the angel Gabriel say that when he's when he's talking to to Mary, he said nothing is impossible with God. So, mm. so there is that statement, isn't there? Verse thirty seven: nothing is impossible with God, and he's he's speaking yes. in the context of both Elizabeth's conception through a natural means, mm -hmm. but clearly helped miraculously and now yes. mary's conception which is totally totally supernatural because it's it, there's no male human agency involved mm. here and and so you get this and the angels go yeah nothing's impossible with god understand mm. that so we we are we are being forced to accept a supernatural idea or of course we are being encouraged to reject a supernatural idea. And on this, you pay your money and you take your choice. One of my favorite authors of the moment is uh, Rich Fiodas. If you haven't read his book, uh, The Deeply Formed Life, mm. I thoroughly would uh, recommend it. But if you, don't, if you don't want to read his book, just go follow him on Instagram because his content is enough. Like, I don't know how he produces this sort of quality content on a, what seems to be a daily basis, but he, he posted this yesterday and I... I I love this. He said, he said, the creation story in Genesis was not intended to be a scientific treatise. Rather, it establishes a theological truth that when God speaks a word, nothing can stop it. True. Advent reminds us that God's word, which is Jesus, was spoken and darkness could not overcome him. Come on. <laughs> Come on. And I just think that that's kind of what we're talking about right here. It's, exactly. it's this sense that at the end of the day, the story begins, and John does this to you. I'm just going to make a point here. The word that spoke the universe into existence has somehow become flesh and now lies in a manger. And mm. and so let's just stretch your faith brain as quick as we can, because this story is going to need it. <laughs> For sure. And, uh, and, and that beautiful language throughout the story with Mary, son of the Most mm. High, the, the allusions into the... Tanakh into the into the Hebrew mm. scriptures, the Old Testament text of El Elyon, the the one who is mm. above all, and and we are being asked to embrace this idea that the the, the God Most High mm. loved us so much that He wanted to engage with us and and come to us and save us. And one of my favorite titles, labels, names of, of the Lord is Emmanuel, with us is God. And my goodness, what an idea. What an idea that is that God became one of us so that he could be with us and so that he could save us. I mean, seriously, it's, it's, yeah. it's a brain frazzling, heart transforming idea mm. that, that, that the Lord would essentially say to humanity and to every one of our listeners, I love you so much that I was prepared to do something in human history that had never, ever been done before and probably mm. never really been conceived in the heart of a man before. That's how much mm. the Lord loves us. And that is essentially at the heart of the birth narrative. It is an incredible expression of how far 
God is prepared to go to redeem humanity? The, the piece, John, where um, it is highly unlikely in my life that I will ever produce a translation of the Bible. But you know that opening, Gabriel comes to Mary and says, greetings, graced one or favored yes. one. And then he says, the Lord is with you. And I always feel like, and I always want to do this when I preach it, I always feel like you need in brackets there, like literally. Because we say that, don't we? It's almost a Christian yeah. greeting, oh, the Lord be with you, Lord. And, yeah. and it's like, Gabriel's like, I'm going to say this, but I, I mean, it's slightly different than how other yes. people other people use it. But ultimately, that's quite fascinating, isn't it? Like, this story is Emmanuel, God with us. God is with uh, Mary, and and as a result, God is with with all of us. Yeah, now, you made striking. an allusion just there. Sorry, you're not an allusion. You made a comment just there, John, about the Old Testament. And it just, it, it, it's also interesting to note that this whole narrative is really deeply rooted in Old Testament allusion, isn't it? Mm. My, my version of the Bible that I use has down the side, whenever a text, kind of New Testament text, kind of alludes to something in the, in the Old Testament, it, it gives uh, me the references down the side of page. You go, hey, you probably want to look at this text, that text, the next text, because mm-hmm. this sort of New Testament text sounds a bit like that Old Testament text. And what I noticed through the opening of Luke's the gospel, and in particular when we cross over into Mary's response to Elizabeth in a moment, like the 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 kind of references and throwouts and allusions to the Old Testament are dense at this stage Absolutely. of the text. But you, I think you've counted, haven't you, uh, Mary's response, which we'll read in just a moment, but mm. Mary's response known as the Magnificat, you you actually, you said to me uh, just before we started recording that, that you kind of counted some of the allusions, hadn't you? Yeah, well, it, it, in terms of some of the things she she says, if, if you were picking up on Tanakh sort of allusions to it, I mean, depending mm. on how you count, there could be as many, maybe more, but I certainly, I certainly saw at least fifteen within mm. her the song that we're about to to read together, and within that, I did a little bit of work on it in terms of tracking them down, and of the fifteen allusions that I think are there within her song, two of them are from the seven of them are from the prophets and six of them from the writings. So for our listeners who understand how a Jew, how a Hebrew Bible is is structured, it, it and that's why you sometimes hear us refer to the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, which is uh, Torah instruction, first five books of the of the of what we call the Old Testament mm-hmm. as Christians. Then the Nevi'im is the prophets, and then the Ketuvim is the writings. So I I reckon there's at least 15 references that are alluded to in Mary's song, two of them Torah, seven of them uh, the writings, and six of them the prophets. So so this is pretty spectacular stuff. And it shows two things, I think, David, a general sense. I think we've got to take our hat off a little bit to Dr. Luke, the only Gentile contributor to the New Testament. And mm. yet he maybe under Paul's tutelage, a brilliant, a brilliant Tanakh scholar, himself schooled under Gamaliel, that Luke may have learned very, very quickly that that he has to learn to read backwards even as a Gentile <laughs> believer and understand mm. that that this Jesus we're now talking about is all over Tanakh. He's all over the Old Testament scriptures. And I think Paul would have helped Dr. Luke with that. And you've got to give Dr. Luke amazing credit that he is able to bring out just reams of nuance in the text, either directly or indirectly. So obviously through Mary's song, it's indirect because he's simply recording her song. But in other cases, he's clearly, he's getting into this idea and he's making references for us over and over again and taking us back there. And, and I think as a general observation, that's really useful. I think secondly, and we're about to lean into this, it shows again my position that Mary didn't just attract the favour of God because that favour is unmerited, but I think Mary is a deep spirituality. And this contrasting to Zechariah's prophecy, as we'll see later on potentially, mm-hmm. this th- there's no there's no direct reference to this being a prophetic utterance, but a response, a song of worship, a song of praise. And it's coming then directly out of the heart of Mary, not just by prophetic unction. So if it's coming out of Mary's heart, then it's in there. 
And it means here's a, a, a what we might think is a young teenage girl in our culture, a young woman in her culture, making at least at least 15 allusions to the Old Testament text and drawing it into mm. one magnificent song. I mean, that is serious. That is a serious idea. Yeah. And when you set that up in contrast and comparison to Zechariah's prophecy, who he was, what he was, what he would have known, it's remarkable. A remarkable song and one that's worthy of our consideration and study. Mm. And I think what's interesting, just as we as we kind of lean in then to read this Magnificat, a little note that, that I find fascinating, again, because of what you've just said about Luke, is that, that in Matthew, for example, you get this representation of Jesus and things happen, and then Matthew pulls text from the Old Testament and has this formula where he says, oh, this, is, this was to fulfill what was said in the prophets. What's interesting is that what Luke gives us the insight into then is these new songs. These songs, yes. although they allude to the Old Testament, these are new utterances from these characters setting up the story of Jesus. And whether you read Zechariah's prophecy, Mary's song, or Simeon's song at Jesus' dedication, they are. Like every year when it gets to Christmas time, I find it difficult not to preach on anything other than those three, <laughs> those three texts, right? Uh, they are just the Christmas story. So are you going to read the Magnificat for, for us just now, John, I, from Luke one forty six? yeah? I would be honoured to read this, and if only I could read it half as well as Mary said it, so, or <laughs> sang it even. And so, and Mary said, verse 46, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And then it says this, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then went home. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, I, I, was, <laughs> I want to say something here, John, to help pastors, okay, and and congregations. And it's, it's almost irreverent, but Luke actually shows you something here, right? That every pastor that I know in the world struggles with on a weekly basis, right? After a phenomenal point of worship, it's okay to have an announcement, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like Come like on. every pastoral meeting I've ever been in about planning a church service. It's like, well, what should we do? We need to somehow tell people to make sure they come on Friday night to the meeting. <laughs> and every pastor figures, how do I do that after that song? And Luke shows us here, it's okay to just end something like that and go, Oh yeah, and then Mary stayed for three months, and then she went home. Or went home, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't take away from the magnificence of what we've just heard. It just. And again, does, doesn't it show us again, David? I, I mean, I love this. Doesn't it show you the earthiness of the story of Jesus? Mm. She doesn't disappear off into some amazing place. She goes home. She has to. <laughs> yes. She has to. And of course, in many ways, she has to face the music. She will go home mm. three months more pregnant. Then, yes. then she left. So, so she's going home to face the music. She's going home to face an uncertain world, a world where, at least in theory, if certain extreme people get their hands on her, she could be stoned to death. So this, mm. this is a bit of a moment. And so she has this incredible spiritual experience with Elizabeth. Elizabeth gets filled with the spirit. The babies leap. Mm -hmm. I mean, only, only, and and this is how it's it's Mary's story because because only only women would would remember the the leaping yes. of a baby the kicking of a baby it's a beautiful yes. feminine insight into that it's just gorgeous and and of course then she has this incredible song and we're taken to the high water mark and our we're taken up into into the heavens in worship and then oh so so the, the the and doesn't it remind 
all of us that the the kingdom of God and the magnificence of what Jesus wants mm. to do in our lives always has to find resonance in the ordinary, yeah. in the everyday, in the routine, in the mundane and in the boring. It's somehow yes. we, we have to find ourselves going back home, whatever home looks like, and appropriating this incredible encounter with the Lord. Well, can I push that further, John, um, in, into the area of supposition? So Mary stays with her about three months, right? So we, like you say, she's going to go home more pregnant. There's definitely questions. Luke alludes to that later in the gospel. There's questions as to Jesus's parental, uh, where he comes from. Uh, so yep. that, so yep. there is scandal around Jesus's birth. But Mary, does because she goes home after three months, she's not gone to hide her pregnancy mm. from her. But here's something that strikes me as interesting just on you talked about the mundane and the routine the story of of mary's uh, encounter with gabriel happens in the sixth month the sixth month of what the sixth month of elizabeth's pregnancy right yep. so the and the angel clarifies this just in case you've missed this the angel says to mary and even now your yep. cousin elizabeth is in the sixth month you know and she was said to be barren and then the angel departs and it says verse 39 of chapter 1 Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country right i i don't ever hear people ask very often why did mary go to elizabeth right yeah. and my supposition here is that she went to help her right because mm. she stays with her right up until the time she's due to give birth. Now, when she gives birth, the family and the midwives of the village will come around and help with that. Yeah. So I think that, that Mary hears, oh, Elizabeth's six months pregnant, and she rushes off to see her. And and I don't hear, I just don't hear a lot of people reflect on why she makes this journey. But to mm. me, the fact that she then stays around and up to the point of Elizabeth being ready to have the child suggests to me she actually goes just to help Elizabeth, an older lady, in the late term of her pregnancy. And there's something to me brilliant about Mary with all of this hanging. What does Mary do as a result of this incredible, incredible announcement from God? Oh, she goes to help her family member. I mean, yes. and I'm yes. I'm leaning a little bit into the into the silence to make that point, but I think there's just enough of the text and what we know of ancient culture that Mary doesn't say, "Well, aren't I fantastic? I'll now sit at home and be pampered," but she just goes and helps. And like I say, it is in the silence, but I think culturally that I think that's what's going on here. Uh, definitely, uh, and also it it. It seems to be affirmed by Luke's own reference to Elizabeth that says that she stayed in seclusion for five months. And and we're not quite sure why, but uh, and maybe a, f a feminine or, or a female view of this would help us a little bit, mm. but could have been could have been embarrassment. It could have been, I don't quite know how to manage this. I'm an older woman and I don't quite know what to do, but she's she's in seclusion. And then, of course, Mary comes in the sixth month. The, the, the other thing, David, I think is undoubtedly there too, is that these two women now have something profound in common. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you've got one woman who gets pregnant naturally, but miraculously, and another woman who gets mm -hmm. pregnant totally supernaturally uh, and miraculously. And you, you, you would have loved Dr. Luke. And maybe he tried, maybe he tried to pry out of Mary. What did you and Elizabeth talk about for three months? <laughs> come on, come on, g give us a bit. Now, I think we've got some of that because I think the detail of Elizabeth's story and Zechariah's mm -hmm. story will have undoubtedly come from Mary. And I think Elizabeth and Zechariah will have told Mary the story. And so Mary passes that on and the detail of that to, to, to Dr. Luke. But my goodness, two women together, both experiencing miraculous supernatural conceptions. What would they have talked about? My goodness. If there is a sort of a heaven flicks section mm. uh, up in heaven when we get there, I, I, that would be one of the... I wonder, is there a little section on the three months of <laughs> Mary and Elizabeth? I'd love to watch that and see what went on. But I, I, they must have had some profound conversations supporting mm. each other, helping each other. And of course, in the Lucan text, what's remarkable is that as soon as John is born, Zechariah and Elizabeth completely disappear from the text. There's not even mm -hmm. a reference to their death or their passing. They just disappear. And mm -hmm. it's like it's like this this glorious, explosive firework 
that explodes in the sky and it's gone. And 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 we just move on. Yes. And of course, the contrast is we don't move on from Mary. Mary becomes and remains an important part of the whole of the story of Jesus. These are sort of things we, we do need to look out for in, in the text. And, and I wonder as well about their conversation about, because like, what strikes me about Mary, Zechariah, Simeon, Actually, Jesus as well, you see this in Jesus' life when it comes to the temptations. These are people who are who are baked in Scripture, right? <laughs> it clearly, it, and there's something, I think there's a discipleship thing for us here, that, that if you're, if you're, like I love that image of being baked in Scripture, like if it's <laughs> baked into your heart, if you're going to learn it and learn it and learn it some more, when you encounter anything, guess what leaks out of you, right? Yeah. And so Mary doesn't quote in the Magnificat, she doesn't quote the Old Testament like in one big chunk. But like you said, the parallels throughout this are all over the place that you oh. listen, you read the Magnificat and you say to yourself, here's somebody that knows the Old Testament. <laughs> Here's somebody that has grown up, and it's like if you ever meet somebody who's like a Shakespeare scholar, they yep. they kind of sound a little like Shakespeare, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> and here you have Mary; she kind of sounds like an Old Testament prophet. Like if you were to yep. take the Magnificat and just drop it into into Isaiah and not tell anyone, and they were just reading one day, you almost wouldn't notice, right? Wouldn't notice <laughs> for sure, and and it. Does it say something, I think, about Mary's upbringing? Does it say something about her attitude? So it might suggest, again, we have to be careful to argue from silence, but it might suggest that she had parents, a father, who wanted to expose her to the to the law, who wanted to expose her to Tanakh and to Torah, uh, mm-hmm. who didn't exclude her from that. It, could it be that, that Mary, whether that was the case or not, was so hungry for the scriptures and hungry for God, that she she made herself available to hear mm-hmm. the law being read, to hear the Torah being read, even though she might not have been allowed to pick it up herself and, and read it for herself. But something is going on where this young woman is saturated in the scriptures. And again, we, we've alluded to this in our, I think our previous podcast, David, where the, the contrast to Zechariah, a trained scholar, it, well, uh, certainly a man trained in the scriptures, a priest, someone surrounded by the word of God in its in its uh, taught sense. And yet you compare, put it, put these two prophecies or the, the Mary's song and Zechariah's prophecy side by side. And they, they, they really do Mary's words hold hold up. This is a serious mm. piece, and 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 of course, I don't I don't know if we, if you've noticed this, David, but for me that I I couldn't help hear Mary's song and hear the echo of Hannah's song in the Old yes. Testament, and and there are some allusions even to Mary's song within Hannah's text, and and if our if our listeners wanted to read. Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2. It's just absolutely beautiful. Uh, and there is a gorgeous extra link right at the end of 1 Samuel chapter 2. Speaking of Samuel, her son, Hannah's son, the son that is birthed miraculously uh, in her situation, it says, And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favour with the Lord and with men. Now, anyone mm. who knows the story of Jesus from Luke will automatically hear an unmissable echo. Luke chapter Mm -hmm. 2 verse 52 says of the boy Jesus when he was leaving the temple and Jesus grew in Mm -hmm. wisdom and in stature and favour with God and with men. I mean it's it's unmissable allusion to the two to the two ideas Mm -hmm. and so there is a symmetry there in the song of Hannah in the song of Mary there's a similarity both women uh, have babies mm. miraculously. The one is is a context of barrenness. The other is a, a sexual virgin. And both have sons that will ultimately grow in the Lord and literally impact and change their world. Of course, the latter son being the mm. son who will change everything. But but the, 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 again, I, I think if if our if our listeners are leaning into the Old Testament allusions, there is almost a direct parallel between the Song of Mary and the experience of Hannah and even that little 
reference to the both boys growing. It's just a really, whoa, that, that looks like the same thing. And of course it isn't, but but the illusion is strongly there. And isn't that, like, goodness, it's so exciting though, John. And because, I, I mean, I agree with you. And even, like, in the Bible societies, cross-referencing that they give you alongside the Greek text, as soon as you get to Luke one forty six, that's the first text they point out. Yeah. Hey, you want to go look at First Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. I love the fact, John, that Mary is steeped in Scripture, but the biggest illusion that she brings out is another female hero of the text. Like, I love this idea as Mary is this little feminist who is who is going, when I get my chance, I'm going to riff on one of one of her heroes in that sense. Like, I think it, I think it's phenomenal. And yeah. and 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 the patterns are really interesting in, in, in one Samuel. My heart rejoices in the Lord. Right. You've got yeah. that. But then but then listen, listen to this here in verse uh, seven. Well, actually, verse six is even really fascinating if this is in Mary's mind. The verse six, the Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings mm. down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. And, yes. uh, and then he goes on to talk about it's not by strength, she says, that one prevails because those who oppose the Lord will be will be broken. And again, look, look at uh, just at the very next little bit. The yes. most high will thunder from heaven. So there's that most high yeah. reference again. El Elyon, yes. the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And then and then look at our little look at our little verse 11 reference there. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli. It's, it's, it's that sort of... At the end, Mary they've even got a line of going home. Indeed, indeed. So so Mary sings her song, goes home. Hannah sings her song. They go home and leave the boy Samuel in the presence of, of the Lord at, at, well, the, at the shrine. Isn't that beautiful? It's phenomenal. It's, Luke is it definitely just, it, doing something there, he's isn't he? He's definitely doing so. Well, I, 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 and it's whether, it's whether we, we even give Luke full credit or... Luke is making sure everybody knows Mary's doing something here, mate. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's like he is yes. saying this is not just some sort of young girl who happens to be a virgin. He's saying this is a serious woman. She is a serious follower of Adonai. She loves mm. the Most High God. She has made herself the Lord's servant. And and to prove it, listen to her song. And, 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 and of course... It's, it may have been someone like Paul who puts Luke onto onto Hannah, but yeah. because Luke may not know that, but certainly Mary knows it because the story of Samuel is one of the most formative in the mm. development of the history of Israel in terms of his great judgeship and and what mm. an incredible leader in many ways he became for the nation. So it's it's a it's an iconic song, an iconic story, and Mary links them together and Luke make sure he puts it in the text so that we understand just how powerful Mary is. I, I, lo I love that in terms of her biblical understanding. There's a song out there. Um, it's a kind of new Christmas song. It was written by Mark Lowry in 1984. Pentatonics made it quite uh, a bit more popular in recent years. I don't know if you know the song, Mary. Yes. And whenever I listen to that song, generally listen to it at Christmas time. And generally at Christmas, at some point, I'm preparing a sermon, a sermon on, on the Magnificat. And whenever I listen to that song, I always find myself going, uh, yes, Yes, she, she did. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, because the Come song on. kind of takes this sort of feel of oh, Mary was just this sort of meek, you know, meek yeah. and mild maiden mother who kind of had this sprung upon her. And you read the Magnificat and you do a little bit of the work on what she's what she's riffing on and channeling on. And you think, goodness, did she know? And she did was she all know? about it. <laughs> Incredible. Like, I love and it. it it is. It's 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 absolutely beautiful. And and I do love elements of her song which echo mm. Hannah. She says, You have been mindful of the humble estate of his servant. I and mean, I just love this from from mm. now on generations will call me blessed. And you don't read arrogance in that. because you, you've yeah. get you, you've got this idea of generations will call me blessed, having just stated 
the humble state of, of, of his servant. Yes. So she understands that this is this grace of God that's picking her up and elevating her in a way that she could never mm-hmm. self-elevate. 100%. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And then David, I love that I love the juxtaposition in the next little mm-hmm. section. He has performed mighty deeds. He has scattered the proud, brought down rulers. Here's Hannah's echo again. Lifted up the humble, filled the hungry, sent away the rich. I, 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 it's almost like, could it be, could it be that Dr. Luke himself becomes influenced by, by Mary's understanding of how the Lord reverses mm. status? And oh, yeah. this becomes a formative idea in the way he shapes his own gospel. And, and we've talked about the fact that John's prologue becomes the sort of key to reading the gospel. And in mm-hmm. many ways, these opening songs of Mary, Zechariah and Simeon, who's, who's the first mm-hmm. Jewish voice in the text to put Gentiles in front of Jews in terms of the salvation. They almost, it's almost like if you read the gospel of Luke through the the lens of these three songs, you mm. get a little bit of a key on how to read the book. Is, is that an overstretch, David, or do you think that's there? I, I, I am a hundred percent with you. Like this to me is programmatic. I think this mm. is, this is a hundred percent programmatic. You need to understand that you're going to see things here. The rich young ruler. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you stories yeah. from <laughs> Jesus's life that 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 actually you know, he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. This is. Yeah, I don't think you can in any way read any of this and not see that he's giving you the keys here to understand what you're about to read. And the mm-hmm. next. The next however many chapters from here on in are going to make more sense if you, like Mary, internalize this stuff. Uh, Because even all of the language you've talked about before about status reversal, I mean, that is what's going on here. He has looked with favor on on the humble one. And uh, the result of that is that all generations will call them blessed. And and, and it's it's that when we get to the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew, the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus... Jesus then gives you discipleship tips on how to live this sort of stuff out. And and, and so you're getting this constant. And again, that contrast we talked about in the last episode, in the time of Caesar Augustus, during the reign of Tiberius, these big power shows are being there, but there's this subtle revolutionary story ticking on underneath uh, of a God who turns things upside down, and, and which is what Hannah was singing about. It's mm. what Isaiah promised and it's what Malachi, Malachi 3, Malachi 3 offers us a, a God who is coming. Make way because he's coming and he's going to set things right. And how is he going to set things right? He's going to raise up the low valleys, but he's also going to bring down the high mountains. And, and there's a correcting. And so it's almost as if you know, the Magnificat functions by Luke to say, okay, Buckle up your seatbelt. We're heading for some rocky territory ahead. And you see it with Jesus' first sermon in the temple, Luke Luke chapter 4, don't you? This this sense that the, the texts that are being chosen are yes. deeply important to understanding the story. It's so true. It's so true. It's so magnificent. And and, and when you when you tap into her story and you tap into her song, you as we've tried to do, we, we've tried to celebrate Mary in these two podcasts together, and I hope we've done a good job in doing that. But I, I'm drawn back to Elizabeth's words, blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her, for it will be accomplished. And and, and I, I just, I, I love that from Elizabeth. Here's Elizabeth saying, you are blessed because you have believed, and because you've believed you will see this thing accomplished and and what will be accomplished in you, Mary, and through you will not only be for you, but will enrich the nations of the world. And men and women, boys and girls will have lives transformed forever because a young woman said, I'm the Lord's servant, be it to me as you have said. And I, I would just encourage our listeners, listen, this Christmas, don't settle for the Christmas card version of Mary. 
dive into this magnificent woman, celebrate her properly, lift her up as one of the greatest, if not the greatest woman who ever lived in human history. Because she was not just, can I say this carefully, she was not just a carrier of a baby, but she was the carrier of the word of the Lord. And I think that's what we see in both her story and her song. Mm. And John, one just final little point of nuance as we land out this episode, just towards the end of the Magnificat. And I think, to me, this is a beautiful thing to remember at Christmas time. The, the translation's awkward to, to express this well. So, but in verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. The, the word remembrance there is is it's an infinitive in Greek, right? And it's mm. used to express result, right? Mm. So just like just think about this. Whatever you tell of the Christmas story, as Mary gets to this point, what's the result of all of this? Is yeah. that God's mercy is not forgotten. Yes. This this is all about the God moving towards us. This is the God coming towards us. And I, I, I love that in Advent. I love that as we come towards Christmas, that in a world that's obsessed with how do we get to God, the Christmas story finds <laughs> finds a young girl in the middle of nowhere Israel and says, hey, God is with us. He is coming yes. towards us. He has not forgotten us. And he is coming with mercy. And and I think of that, I think of that image from Isaiah, the Lord rises up. And and Isaiah uses the language of a of a general rousing his troops for war. He rises up to show us mercy. And, and I think that whole kind of underpinning of this story is the beauty of why we tell this every single Christmas, isn't it? Magnificent, magnificent. Bless you, man. So good. <laughs> <laughs>